Okay, I think I think we're going to get started here. Um, first off, welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, there is in your on your Zoom screen up in the right hand corner. There's a little toggle switch for grid view, which is all the boxes, and then speaker view, which will highlight whoever's speaking at the moment, which right now would be me. Um, I would suggest going with the speaker view, but you can kind of toggle back and forth and see which <laughs> which you prefer. Um, let's see. So uh, my name is Kristen Summers and I am the owner of Red Bat Books and I'm the one who published uh, John's book, Monkey Island. Oh. Um, and I heard you guys talking, some of you talking about uh, ordering the book. The I have received um, many orders and they are, have been shipping out over the last week or so. So I'm sorry if uh, you haven't received it yet, but I, I am fulfilling all those orders for you. So <laughs> it will be there soon. Um, and as far as ordering, you can order from our website. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat a couple times over the evening, so that's easy to get to. It's still um, uh, the sale price, it's $15, and then we're gonna continue the sale price for a few, uh, few more days, and that's $2 off. Um, the retail price. You can order it through us for, for that sale price. You can also order it online from Amazon or bookshop.org or Barnes and Noble. Or as I heard some, someone mention, you can also request it from your local bookstore. It's available through Ingram and your bookstore can order um, through that distribution company. So you're welcome to uh, request it from your local bookstore. And thank you so much for, for the orders. Yeah. We, we definitely appreciate that. So um, let's see, another thing, uh, just to make the evening a little easier for everybody, I'm gonna ask that we turn all of our mics off while John's reading, and that will just keep outside noises from distracting him and, and the other listeners. And then towards the end, we will have a Q&A session with John and uh, you can turn on your mic at that point and uh, we can ask questions and, and chat a little bit with John uh, after he's done reading. So um, again, thank you so much for being here. And I'm gonna hand this over to our editor, Greg Johnson, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about John and uh, get things started. So Greg. Hello everyone, thank you. Thanks, Kristen. I, uh, I noticed this morning that it is now estimated that anthropogenic objects outweigh all of the global biomass. So all of our stuff now tips the uh, scales against all life on Earth. One of the reasons I like poets <clears throat> and musicians uh, is that they don't make much stuff. They make meaning and space and rhythm and coherence, and not a lot of stuff. Uh, some poets can even take that a step further and turn all that stuff back into meaning. One of the metaphors you'll hear tonight describes a grassroots, small-scale, family-run venture with whirly birds and grappling hooks. Well, I, I don't want to give anything away, so I'll just leave it there. Uh, suffice it to say, I've been thinking about that poem all day long. John Morrison earned his MFA from the University of Alabama and has been published in many prestigious journals such as Rhino, the Cimarron Review, Poetry Northwest, and the Seattle Review. John received the C. Hamilton Bailey Fellowship from Literary Arts, won the Ray and Seymour Gorsline Poetry Competition uh, with his 2007 book, Heaven of the Moment. He is both poet and educator of poets having taught at the University of Alabama, WSU Vancouver, and at the Attic Institute. Please join me in welcoming John Morrison and his new book, Monkey Island. Hi, everybody. There it is. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Okay, so um, you gotta gotta understand it's uh it's a little overwhelming. 
to have uh, such friends and to have um, the, the faith that uh, Kristen and Greg had in my work to put it in a book for me, for us, for, um, for history. How's that? Um, I wish we could all be somewhere in a big dance hall drinking beer and um, a lot of us reading poems. Um, but until we're able to do that, I'm just grateful that we can be together as electrons, if nothing else. I owe a lot of folks for, um, for the help on this book. A lot of them are in this room with us. Um, they're folks I've learned from, I've taught with, and taught, and then learned from. Uh, I certainly owe Kristen and Greg. I owe Dave Drecke, a good pal who's been with me through the creation of this whole book, and who thinks he titled this book, although our memories don't always square. I owe um, Sarah Guest, who has been a, a really a stalwart friend towards uh, toward a lot of the work trying to get this this book out there in the world. Um, I owe Meryl Merrill, um, who did the cover for the book. And I said, Meryl, can you draw me Monkey Island? And she said, um, I can't draw it, but I can draw what the view is from it. So that's, uh, that's our Meryl. Um, so, um, and I also want to thank Don Colburn. He, he delivered beer to my house prior to this reading, and I, I suspect he took a six pack to everybody's house. So if you go check your porch right now, it's probably cooling off in the, in the evening. Um, so Greg is watching the chat. If you want to ask, if you're silly enough to ask a question, um, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, respond as best I can at the end of the evening. I think I'll read about 10, 10 poems, now 11, I think. Um, but first, I would like to um, begin with, a, with just an acknowledgement that I'm sitting upstairs in a room that is on um, the traditional lands of the Chinookan and Kayapuyan nations since time immemorial that Portland is home to the ninth largest urban native population in the United States and is home to 380 federally recognized tribes. And I'm, the, since I've been reading poetry, I, I've read great native writers, including our poet laureate, Joy Harjo, our uh, poet laureate of Oregon a few years ago, um, Elizabeth Woody. Um, uh, the, the resilience and the creativity of the Native people is uh, something we should all pay a lot of attention to. So, um, listen, I, I, the, to, to begin, the book is dedicated to Peter Sears, who was a uh, really an important friend to me and to a lot of us, right? Um, he always shared what he had, and he had just this deep reservoir of knowledge. Um, he really was like a friend to everybody. And I'd like to begin by reading one of his poems from his book, Small Talk. Um, it's called, I Hum to My Shivering. I'm walking along the road at night, shivering, humming to my shivering. I walk into a spider web in a doorway that's what it feels like. I wave my hand across my face. Snow. I've caught it just as it starts. It smells good. Maybe things will be okay. I worried all day. I couldn't keep anything down. Look, the snow seems to part as if opening up a passageway. Is that how it feels like going over to the other side? When I go, maybe I'll dissolve like one of these snowflakes. I look up into so many against the night. Flakes land in my palm one at a time. 
I feel like a happy old God. So that's Peter. Um, and Peter also had a, <laughs> it's a, a great poem. It's, it's a little bit goofy. Um, it was called My Darkness. And so um, I responded to that poem with one called Your Darkness. Is your dark ever silky as old port or soft is the underside of a calendula petal with your eyes closed? Or is your dark more like a knobby patch of summer tar mounded in a pothole? The same tar the dumb kid would twist off in a wad to chew like blackjack gum. Without any of the warm light in that memory, just the oily, shiny, black and sticky, a syrup and ears and eyes down your throat and nose until you're full or swallowed? Or is your dark my dark? A black gravel with a few flickering gray pebbles sifted in, all in motion like a slow storm, a fine emery cloth on the skin, a grim spa, yes, brisk, but no doubt grinding me down. Um, next, I'd like to read, uh, I'd like to read this poem for um, for Greg. I didn't intend to, but it's the but he promised you, so I wanna I wanna get his back on this one. Um, I took a trip with my brothers Mike and Tim a few years back, and we were just driving a lot of country, and we noticed just how much junk there is. You know, as it says, old tractors in the field, but just. There's junk. So there's a good project for somebody who wants to go clean that up. And, you know, when you're taking long drives, you come up with plans. My brothers and I are coming back with a whirly bird to salvage all the tractors seized and left to rust in the wheat. The tractors that muscle the farmer one furrow more and no farther. Sure, he unbuckled the hood and checked for spark primed the tinny carburetor again and again, cursed and walked for a ranch across the turned dirt, gave up on the goddamn and thin moonlight. We're coming back from the machinery out to pasture and melting down scrap to pour a new spine for our national renaissance. We have to wear earplugs and hard hats. One brother will pilot, hold the copter steady against gusty winds as the other two rappel down bulky chains secure the Hulk, a dot in heartland with heavy hooks and whisk our prize away across the sky to the giant cauldron, smoky red as a demon eye. We move west after Midwest, haul off junker cars tipped in arroyos, flimsy forgotten homes that stink of ammonia and mold, all dropped into the molten royal, then the giant odd jacks of failed public art, then the giant burnished silvy, silly silver O's. And I just got realized once again that I got in trouble um, running down public art at the end of that stanza in front of a bunch of artists in this room. So um, I would write it differently next time. How's that? Um, this next poem um, is sort of a game where you try to get as far away from the first line as you can by the end of the poem. Um, and in it, I, I talk about pink macaroons and I wanna own up to the fact that I stole those from Mary Sebus. After the heist, we can drop by the gloomy little bakery, step into the soft aromas and pick up a dozen macaroons, pink sit on a stone bench outside the Museum of Natural History, count our loot into the high 300s, and I can ask you however you feel, and I can ask how you feel whenever you see the skeleton of a woolly mammoth, the bones tea stained to a shiny rich mahogany, puzzled, amused, empty. A woolly mammoth with a big bony dome crammed with all her smarts and kindness could be a first rate friend once we wash her, once we run her through the car wash a few times. Close your eyes, little sister, close your eyes. 
we'd never be cold at night. The whole family wound in the deep pile of her pelt, asleep in the oceanic swells of her husky breathing and dreaming austere tundra dreams. Gentle with any talk of extinction, no one takes the topic well. When we can't get enough, when we can't keep enough cereal in the house, can't make nearly enough popcorn balls for her snacks, we'll lead her by trunk to the breadth of the Zumwalt prairie, the vast grassland, into quiet contemplation and sear winds. She'd browse and amble and fit in out there, eyed from the distance by wolves, just like at home in prehistory. So I'd like to read um, a couple, I didn't write them at the same time and I didn't intend for them to be linked, but they, they clearly are. Um, when I was six, my father was stationed in the Philippines for a year uh, in flying cargo flights for the Vietnam War. He was a Air Force pilot, also a socialist, um, but an Air Force pilot. Um, and I would overhear on TV uh, the fact that there were guerrilla fighters and that, that terrified me. The fact that my father was somehow fighting guerrillas, which both seems wrong and really dangerous. Um, and it wasn't until I wrote these poems that I remembered um, that particular fear. Um, and then when he came back, and this appears in the second poem, uh, in play, he adopted sort of a, uh, he, a, a persona. He called himself the Bink of Moncom, which was some giant monkey or gorilla, and he would chase us around and throw us, toss us around. Um, the first poem. For a full year, our father lived away on an island and flew planes heavy with missiles and gold and on weekends with golf with gorillas. At home, our mother was lost in the pantry or the laundry, the attic or behind the water heater where she'd opened up the electrical panel with a trouble, night, trouble light and butter knife tinkered with the base circuitry of our home. Summer, my older brothers found a shaded bank along Wild Horse Creek where they and their 16 year old friends could drink beer and slug each other. My oldest sister neglected her hair and washed the dishes. My next sister read historical novels in a room for nine straight days, slept for three, and went back to reading. My little sister sucked a pedal and kept asking, where's dad? I'd say, sis, the plane, the missiles, the gold, the golf, the gorillas, remember? Then the lights would flicker out and from deep in the house, we hear mother curse, damn. They'd flicker back on and the big fan in the living room, a monster my size by the name of Arctic Breeze with a blade like my father's propeller would wind up to a deep resonant whir and spit a subtle rose water from a reservoir our mother filled each morning with a potion of crushed red and yellow velvet petals. I was the family dog, sniffing the trail by the creek, sniffing the steps to the basement, the threshold of my sister's room, the clean plates in the dish drainer. The family dog, unless I was a boy answering my sister, gold, golf, remember, missiles, gorillas, or lying on the living room floor, damp in fragrance, or wrenching the rabbit ears right on the TV, to scare away the ghost stalking Daniel Boone and his Cherokee blood brother, the fey yet lethal Mingo, a TV I would now and then hug. You know, younger folks don't know that you could, you used to be able to hug TVs <laughs> and they were warm. Um, try to hug a TV now, Angular, it makes no sense. Um, so this is a, the poem inspired, for, inspired by when my dad got back after that year. My father, the gorilla. My own father didn't know what to do with me. 
His hairy arms held me close to hairy chest and I looked up into his soft troubled eyes. The church and Darwin told him, you can't have a human child, but he cared more for me than dogma. He chased my cousins and me around the yard with a rolling knuckle running gait, whooping and tipping over baby hippos and stuttering, you bad monkeys, you bad monkeys, you bad. We used pith helmets as bowls for coconut milk and explorer knives to scratch our butts and cut ourselves free from the webs of giant spiders. And for our whole time together, we loved the trees and the breeze at night. We'd climb into high hammocks we braided from python skins, sway and hum until we fell asleep. Then at 20, I needed more than bananas and grubs, crouching in the rain with only a leaf for a hat and always being wary of poachers and missionaries. I met my mate on the path by the blue giraffes. She brought me a pair of trousers and then led me away to have our own children who grow more human with every tomato. No word in gorilla says forever. So my father and I slapped each other goodbye. Um, this next poem, I, I, I literally got, <laughs> laughed myself awake and uh, wrote it, drafted it, middle of the night, went back to bed. And I hope I'm not overselling it, but I, I, I thought it was a pretty good laugh at the time. We've been together all night on the ferry. God in black acts the ass and embarrasses himself brags he can end us, and all sapiens in an instant, all sparrows too. He wouldn't dare dish this shit if the Holy Spirit were here to twist his ear. So Mike, in a glorious act of bravado, reaches over, gives God enough of a shove, he trips, topples right into the sound. The splash kicks up as a fairy powers past. We know we're in for it. We also know no real harm done to someone named Almighty. He'll be furious, yes. We'll take our lumps. Hope he's outgrown his Old Testament temper. Off the ferry, Mike and I park downtown, sit in the back of the pickup, then wait for God. When out of a side, when out of a side alley, he runs through traffic right at us. In an, in an embrace of the inevitable, while simply crowning around, we wave, yell, hey God, over here. He's soaked, pissed, never has a moment been more precious. We climb down out of the truck, hug him, say sorry, ask if he's okay. Though he's mad enough to teach us a profound lesson in the chain of being, he's charmed by our high spirits and hijinks. And we are contrite. Pushing anybody off a moving ferry is wrong, regardless of how omniscient he might be. We bow, eyes closed, so he can talk to us inside our heads. Then I pull the ratty army blanket from behind the seat, help God from his sopping shirt, pants, lace boxers, socks like sea slime, down to the flesh none of us can see and say the same way. I see mirror what the dark moon sees, myself a negative. I see a passage and down the passage, a child on the other side of the world, her bright face the size of a quarter. I look to his sad waterlogged feet, wrinkled all as though pickled, then we wrap him snug and all sit in the back of the pickup in the warm peach of a morning sun, smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, sing slow and deep, Swing low, sweet chariot. Um, don't tell anyone. Um, occasionally, uh, rats get in our garage. And I have to fight them there so I don't have to fight them here in our house. Um, so, trap a rat. Searing stink, black eyes, whiskers, soft ears. 
pinned by her snaky tail alive, wondering, where's my mother, whose neck snapped in another corner? You know you will be a killer. Let go, she'll return to the raptors in the garage, or worse, stray across the grape arbor and gnaw into the crawl space, and you'll hear her skitter as she nests for a mischief of pups, deep in cottony insulation, like a cloud in the dark for a vision of heaven at night. Cured of the fatal allure of bacon, wise to the scent of guile, she and forever her progeny will never be fooled by another trap. The commotion above your insomnia will blur into the single voice, weak and hoarse, the dying man whose one wish is to drink from a fountain dedicated with a plaque to all good that was, with a sparkling water that sips sweet as a last backward glance. Now, um, we've made it to Monkey Island. Um, there's seven sections, I'll just pause. I might say a word, I might pause and say a word right before the last section. Cleaning up junk left over from making the universe. The first monkey dropped a meteor, seared all the surrounding trees. Now the monkeys press their hand and footprints into the still steaming metal to mark their moment in the creamy gleam. Monkeys always argue their favorite color. Midday, the sky just above the boulder, the translucent ear of a newborn, what dolphins breathe, inside an oyster shell, the cave mouth, Lava at night, fresh coconut meat. Palm of the great mother after she rubs her chin. Her chin? For the winter solstice, the monkeys trail long strands of tinsel for one more night. They ache the next day and sleep on the beach. The children bury them in the sand up to their faces, and the faces become a long path of stepping stones. To escape the thieves who come one night, all monkeys climb down and hide inside coconuts for 61 years. When a storm tossed a giant spotlight up onto the beach wedged in the V between two palm trees. Half the monkeys wanted to gut the metal for decorations and turn the large drum into a toy. They keep the spotlight hole for their plays. Always a scuffle and children bite to be, excuse me, always a scuffle and monkeys bite to be on the stage crew. Spotlight the villain. Spotlight the couple kissing in the wings. Spotlight the magic stone in the hand. Stay with the stone. In the red wind, even old monkeys are scared when flying fish pelt the island. The typhoon leaves behind golden glass floats in the lagoon, a cave open where there was no cave and a deflated silk balloon drapes the trees like the slinky negligee of a giantess. Okay, here's the last section. And there's this phenomenon at the beach. You look out, it's sunset, instead of seeing the sun just go down as a, you know, the big, beautiful orange ball, it starts to form uh, like, literally like a pillar, pillar of fire. One, oh, and I should tell you, you see that pillar? It probably is landing right on Monkey Island. One sunset, every monkey took a turn inside the pillar of flame, and every monkey ached to share the light with loved monkeys no longer alive. 
Each thought, I want to hug the missing monkey who already gave their body to the river. We grew up where it was windy, and I mean days of wind. Our first house was carved into a wall of wind. The world was wind. Inside, we were wind. The whoosh of blood, the whoosh of red wind, regular and unforeseen. Our nerves belong to the wind. You hid like a mole in a tunnel or stubborn stayed to roughen in the wind. At night, we slept in the wind and the scent now of distant animals, now a forest to the north, and now the ocean stings our lips. The wind flowed like light through the fingers of a God who didn't always believe in kindness, touched our ears, slapped with an open hand. Okay, I'll, I'll read two more. By spring, my mother will be the size of a gnome and could become lost as the garden leaves out. Mother, I'll call. Mother, would you like some tea? A rustle in the hydrangea where she's made a little nest to stay cool come summer and she peeks out. Cinnamon? I say cinnamon in your blue mug. Cobalt blue from a doll's china set. I cup her up onto my shoulder and we stroll to the kitchen nook as she chatters about the wind chime and how sweet the neighbor's one-eyed cat. I tell her soon she will be too tiny to be out by herself because of the nasty scrub jay and before I too begin to shrink, I can make room for her, I can make room for her in an acorn charm around my neck until she is so wee, she fits among the molecules where I walk and breathe, walk and breathe. Um, so this last poem, my chair is squeaking. Um, this last poem is new, but I really want to take the opportunity to share it because of who's here. Um, in part, I wrote this poem because we're in a plague and I'm thinking about the end of the world and I'm thinking about goats. Um, so this is, this is borrowed from the gospel of Mark where Jesus sorts the righteous from the rest of us. And I, I've already confessed in some ways, I steal every time I read. Um, but looking back um, as I wrote this poem and started looking back at it, I realized I'd stolen from two uh, so important teachers to me, Gary Thompson and Dara Wire. Um, and so I, I think that's, I, I hope that's an act of love to steal from your teachers. Um, and it really feels like it's like it's an inside job when you do something like that. So this is goats from sheep. The day of reckoning, you and I will say hello for the first time. Everyone edgy, I will peel and offer half an orange. Though goats are a little unsettling, the way they stare with amber eyes. For luck, I like to rub the bony nub between the horns, and you know why. How determined they are. How with a tap, tap of gentle correction, they can browse the day of fearful bramble, even in heaven. How enlightening, sturdy, they just breathe to bestow calm upon companion horse. There will be a lot of barking from all the frightened doggies. A lot of erratic moths loose in the air, but with lovely ferny antenna and opalescent wings. Fuchsia is your color. 
We can lock eyes to stay steady. Reach, tangle fingers, and then hold hands up to the end. Maybe after. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>